interviewing uh, Amy Wesselman for the Oregon Wine History Project for Women in Wine. And it is uh, December 13th, 13th, December 13th, 2012. Um, so Amy, why don't you start by talking about um, how you, you know, give us some background. How did you get started in the wine industry? Well, my husband and I, now husband and I, actually got started in the wine industry because we were at Reed College finishing up our degrees in philosophy. And we happened to be living in a house that was next door to John Paul from Cameron Winery. And so on the weekends and the evenings or whatever, he would come over and knock on our door and say, hey, you know, do you want to come help and, and rack or prune or top barrels or bottle? A lot of bottling. Um, and from doing that, we sort of learned our way around the wine cellar and around the vineyard. And 20 years ago, it was certainly the case that if you had those skills, you could pretty much go to any winemaking region in the world and find a place where they would let you use them. Not for pay necessarily, but for experience. So when I finally finished up my thesis, instead of going to, going to get my PhD in philosophy, which was my plan, uh, David and I took off for uh, jobs that David Adelsheim actually arranged in uh, Burgundy. So David interned at Domaine Dujac and uh, I interned at Domaine de Larlo and it was a terrible vintage. It was 1991 and as a result we learned an astonishing amount about how to make wine because we watched these people who had done it for years struggle with a very difficult harvest. Mm -hmm. So what are, the, what are some of the things when you say that you learned about what they would do? What, what, are, some, what are a couple examples maybe of things that you would? Um, 91 presented Burgundy with just about everything that you can fear as a winemaker. They had hail damage, they had uh, a ton of rain, uh, the harvest was very late, it was very cold, things weren't as ripe as they would have liked, but really disease pressure from both the, the hail damage, which gives you a little, little uh, if once you break the berry skin with something like hail, you uh, you have a way for bacteria and other things to get in. And so that creates disease spread in the vineyard. And once things are wet, it's the same thing. And so there's a lot of botrytis, a lot of botrytis. In fact, when you, th there were times when beautiful, beautiful vineyards would produce grapes that would produce just a cloud of, of spores in the air. And they did an amazing job without many of the winemaking tools that we have now of sorting, in some cases berry by berry, um, declassifying a lot of things from, from Grand Cru to village wines, which is a, another lesson that, you know, if the wine's not, not good enough, don't say it's good enough. Um, but also just, you know, running hot, fast fermentations to take care of some of those things. We, we have a lot, of, a lot more tools in our toolkit nowadays mm -hmm. in terms of, of, you know, stuff that you can get from the lab to deal with these, these challenges at this point. But back then, a hot fermentation and a, a, a not very generous rack was, was the trick. Mm -hmm. So the okay. wines turned out pretty well. <laughs> so, so you go and you do the internships and then... Then we traveled around for a while and uh, did a lot of thinking about what we wanted to do. Um, and we sort of came to the conclusion that there are two ways to get into the wine business. You can start with a big pile of money and watch it dwindle away, or you could start with nothing and just see what happens. So we thought, well, we're in a perfect spot to do the first. So we started um, with 400 cases of, of wine that we produced in 1993, uh, and we really had nothing to lose. And now we're a family of four, and we have 22 acres of vineyard on a 50-acre parcel in the Dundee Hills, and uh, produce four to six thousand cases a year and I, so somehow we grew up um, but it was a very slow process and a lot of hard work. Okay. So um, why don't you tell us who your husband is and what your winery is. Ah, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David Autry is my husband and um, we started West Street Wine Company in 1993 after working at uh, places in Burgundy but also many places in Oregon uh, at uh, Adelsheim, at Bethel Heights, at Rex Hill. Uh, Argyle, and once we sort of learned from the masters in Oregon, we felt as though if we didn't have the answer to a question, we could always call someone and ask. And that was really the impetus for us to say, okay, it's time to take the plunge. Mm -hmm. 
So philosophy um, seems like a rather interesting major to have gone. <laughs> well, uh, yes and no. To me, my background in philosophy applied very well to making wine. Mm -hmm. um, my thesis was on uh, Aristotelian ethics, which is not uh, merely a subject that encompasses uh, you know, the religious or moral questions. It's really about how to live a meaningful, valuable, whole life. And to me, making wine is about working outside and inside, with your hands, with your mind, with people, and in a solitary fashion. And that sort of balance in a life is very important to me. And the same is true of wine. You need to have balance of alcohol and of fruit and um, of acid and it, all of those aspects in the wine and also in the vineyard. The plants need to be balanced. And Aristotle very much believed in, in balance. A balanced life will make you a happy person. And so I, um, I think it does apply. OK. So. Um so you start in 1993. Mm -hmm. um, how did you guys go about starting the finding the land, starting the winery? Well, we did it backwards. We started by purchasing fruit. Since we, we had worked for Cameron Winery, um, they're closely tied with Abbey Ridge Vineyards. Um, and we've purchased Abbey Ridge fruit for, uh, since our first year. So this is our 20th vintage. So mm -hmm. for 20 years, we've been buying fruit from them. We bought fruit from a few other uh, vineyards that we liked from around the Willamette Valley and uh, Bethel Heights kicked in a little bit of fruit for our first vintage and we were sort of off and running and then over the years we played with our little portfolio of vineyards um, and really kind of found that we loved working with Bethel Heights fruit and we loved working with Abbey Ridge fruit that's the Eagle Amity Hills versus the Dundee Hills and so uh, at one point we had to decide we, you know we're ready to purchase some land where is it going to be? Is it going to be in the Eola Hills or is it going to be the, the Dundee Hills or someone, somewhere else? And David Lett actually said, well, do you like blackberries better or strawberries? <laughs> and I, I said, well, David, I, I love strawberries. You know that. I worked for you for five years and how many flats of strawberries have we eaten in during that time together? And um, I think it's very true that, that a red strawberry fruit is a hallmark of the Dendy Hills, and so we bought uh, for 50 acres there next door to Abbey Ridge. Okay. okay. Um, now you've also, um, uh, you've got another connection with the wine industry through IPNC, both of you, you, you and your husband. Why don't you talk about what you and your husband do with the International Pinot Noir Celebration? Um, well, the last year that I was at IRI, I was asked to be on the board of directors of the International Pinot Noir Celebration, which was this great honor because just uh, like a year prior was the first year that our wine had been selected to be featured at the IPNC. And um, both being on the board and being asked to, to present one, wines were, were just a huge you know, feather in our cap as a winery. And then uh, Maria Stewart, who was then the executive director, who now has our Stewart Mm -hmm. with her husband, Rob Stewart, uh, she got pregnant, and since her first baby had arrived on Saturday of IPNC the two, two years prior, she thought perhaps it would be better if she didn't have that job anymore. <laughs> so uh, they asked me if I would become the executive director, and I thought about it for a blink of an eye and said, yes, I would love to um, help put on arguably the best wine event in the world, the most fun art, uh, wine event in the world. And uh, so I was the executive director for 10 years. I took a little hiatus. Uh, Whitney Schubert, who's a Linville grad who had worked with IPNC for years, was the director for three years. And uh, she's since departed to take a wonderful job in New York, and I'm back and, and loving it. Uh, we had two small vintages at the winery, and they were missing an executive director, and, and so it seemed like a, a really good fit. My husband, David, is in charge of what we call the wine room which really isn't that much of a room anymore because all of the IPNC activities take place outdoors except for the main seminars. And so the, the wine runs around on a refrigerated truck. It's all organized down to every seminar, to every meal. Uh, and boy, I think it's usually about 22 pallets. A, a pallet has 50 odd cases of wine on it that come down from the Travis Abbey Wine Warehouse to Linfield College for use during the weekend. Not all of it gets used, 
but you have to have it there just in case you need it. So uh, his job, literally, is to make sure that he and his team get every single bottle of wine exact, exactly where it needs to go throughout the three days of the event, which is uh, not a small challenge. So um, w one of the interesting features of uh, when we've talked with women from the first, sort of that first generation, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, Nancy Ponzi, Susan Sokol Blosser, um, Diana Lett did an interview with us, um, has been there, you know, and, and I've talked to, about, with this about several people, it just, there's, there's that picture that just about everyone, including, you know, we used it of kind of, I think it's the seven men, you know, it's like Chuck right. Curry and David sure. Lett holding, toasting the wine. Yeah. And, and there's this, um, in fact, I think we're, um, Rachel and I are actually working on a, we've got a second grant to look at Latinos. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it just seems like there are sort of two, two groups of people that specifically are in the shadows really supporting those men mm -hmm. that aren't kind of part of the picture. Um, right. uh, and, you know, and Susan Sokol Blosser in her interview talks about, you know, running running the vineyards right and then going and getting an award and having people turn to bill blosser and ask him questions about her programs That's right true. and That's just true. saying how invisible she felt um you know with you and david how is it seems like you've got a very different relationship there in terms of recognition in terms of you know how, how do you guys work at the winery and how is it the same or different from maybe that first generation? Well, these sorts of changes occur slowly over time. And I've seen that change happen between my experience and, say, Diana Lett's experience, um, but also from when I started and now. Uh, certainly, I have heard many, many, many times people say, so David does the vineyard and the winery and you kind of do the marketing? Um, that's... <laughs> one of my very least favorite comments to hear. Not that I, I don't enjoy going out to markets and not that I don't do that. It's just that the conception is um, you couldn't possibly be, you know, driving tractor, could you? Or driving forklift. Or my favorite, uh, driving forklift while I was pregnant with my twins. Uh, one of my very favorite wine quotes of all times comes from David Lutt saying, looking at me the day before bottling our Pinot Gris when I was eight months pregnant with twins and saying, you're going to drive the forklift? I'm going to have to drive my forklift down to your winery to lift you onto your <laughs> forklift. <laughs> and it was very tongue-in-cheek tongue and, um, and absolutely hilarious. And I actually did check to see if I could fit behind the forklift before it. And there was plenty of room. But, <laughs> but um, the, the way it works for David and I is that we work as a team. We really do. Um, I think with both of us coming from a, a philosophy back ground, when we were sort of carving out our relationship, we argued with each other. That's what philosophers do. <laughs> and part of the reason that I left that realm. Um, <clears throat> however, it means that you're very comfortable disagreeing with one another and you don't take it personally. So our winemaking approach has not been one of, okay, you do the vineyard, I do the winery, or uh, you, you make the white wines and I'll make the red wines. We thought about all of that. But when it comes down to it, I really value working together because winemaking and wine growing is very, very subjective in the end. You can look at your lab results, you can do your comparative tasting. When it comes down to when to pick a vineyard, it really comes down to, I think it tastes right. I think it smells right. I think the vineyard looks right. And if you're having a bad day, or if you have a cold, um, or if you just, whatever function of taste and smell is not working the way it normally does for you, it can throw off a major decision for you. So all of our blending decisions are made together. That's probably the most contentious besides picking date. Um, and I tell people when they, when they ask about our blends, you know, how we do it, well, we approach blending by taking our favorite barrels of whatever lot it is that is to be blended, putting them together, and then arguing about which barrels should get kicked out, which barrels should be added back, and in the beginning, it was uh, more contentious. Now I'd say that we've been doing this for 20 years together. There's a certain look that David gets on his face when he's going to hold on to that barrel. <laughs> and it's not <laughs> worth fighting for. And the same is true for me. If I absolutely love, if he sees me write, yum, exclamation point, exclamation point, buy a barrel on a tasting note, he knows there's no fighting that one. Uh -huh. um, 
but still, you know, there, there are those looks from drivers when they come and pick up wine at the winery and I jump on the forklift and they just look at me like I'm crazy. Or um, my favorite is when we actually sort of uh, dress up for the, the open houses on Thanksgiving and Memorial Day and, and uh, I'll jump onto the forklift wearing a skirt. Or if, you know, I, I remember times when I was working at IPNC and dressed to meet with someone who I had to look slightly fancy for, mm -hmm. and then being called away to either load a truck or unload glasses or something, because we, we, we often offloaded trucks that were bound for IPNC over at our winery, because we have a forklift. So run over to the winery, jump on the forklift in the, the linen skirt and the sleeveless top, and I'm off and running. And our neighbors look, they scratch their heads, <laughs> and they say, well, I, you know, to, be, to each around, I guess. <laughs> So um, you also have, have the twins, mm -hmm. um, as we know, because we've been, had a little incident trying to get you here last week. Yes, <laughs> last week. yes. But the, the twins are, um, you know, tell us a little bit about um, family life around the winery, and then I need you to tell the story about losing the twins at IPNC. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh when I, I, I plan to get pregnant, people often ask me, did you plan on having twins? And I said, well, I plan on having one. <laughs> and uh, it was a big surprise to have two. David and I both worked very hard to get the winery and IPNC sort of latchkey ready so that nothing had to be done um, for a period of time after the twins were born. Uh, so basically, IPNC was ready to go by the Friday before the Monday when I delivered the twins. Everything, all the spreadsheets were done, all of the delegating had been done, all of the seminars were in place, and I had a fantastic staff who was supporting me during that period. So they were born on my birthday, on April 28th, uh, Leo and Soren, and were very healthy, and attended the very first, their very first IPNC that summer when they were still infants. and. They have attended every IPNC since and would absolutely not miss it for the world. Uh, that very first IPNC, of course, everybody was waiting to see these twin babies. And, and at one point, I handed them, one of them, I don't remember which one, <laughs> this is embarrassing, uh, <laughs> to, to a very good friend of mine, Marcus Goodfellow, who was, you know, cooing over him. And, and Marcus handed the baby to another very good friend who handed it to another very good friend who handed it to another very good friend and apparently uh, the radios that we used during IPNC uh, were giving up quite a bit of chatter about what are the West Street twins is, is missing and and in fact he, he was missing in a sea of a thousand people and I didn't know where he was but I assumed that he was somewhere safe because it's IPNC and it's Linfield College and what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so he came back to me long before I heard that people were worried about it, and uh, thank goodness for that. Uh, so I, I don't know what he did that evening, but he had a good time. He was gone for about an hour. <laughs> um, and since then, they have been the self-proclaimed popsicle giver-outers uh, during IPNC weekend. They love to work in the wine room with their dad. They, um, I remember one event where Jensis Robinson was here, very famous British, lovely person, very, very knowledgeable about wine, and it was a huge honor to have her here. And just as we were about to be done with the popsicle handing out, which means that popsicles were all down the front of the shirts of the twins, <laughs> they were red and orange and lime green, uh, I was rushing them back to get them cleaned up because I was embarrassed, and Jancis Robinson turned around and said, oh, a popsicle, how lovely. <laughs> and, and so they handed her the popsicle, and she later said it was her favorite moment during IPNC. I, of course, was mortified by <laughs> the look of my kids. Um, so from that to, to just seeing all the people that they know during IPNC, they've really grown up at IPNC. Mm -hmm. But they've also grown up in the vineyard and the winery, and they wouldn't trade that for any other kind of upbringing. We don't live on the vineyard, but coming to the vineyard during the summer, especially during harvest, is something that they really treasure. And as I told them this year, as of this vintage, they became truly useful. 
and they felt so great to be truly useful, both in the vineyard and in the winery. We've never trusted them with things like wineries but, or grape snips uh, because they're very sharp. This year they, they picked buckets, they got a tag like everybody else, and they picked buckets of fruit, and they kept at it, and I think Leo picked 32 in one day. It was really remarkable. And I was really proud that they, um, they, don't, they don't see winemaking and the enjoyment of wine as, oh, mom and dad have parties with friends over and they love wine, but they see it as actual taking pride in the work that they do in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. They like to sucker the vines, they like to do leaf pull, they come into the, the winery and they know exactly what to do. They know the whole setup of how we process fruit and where they need to be and when to spray out a bin and when to go grab dado because we're out of SO2. And it, it was very remarkable to have them, them there this year and have them be so so how old are they? They're nine now. Nine, okay. Yeah. yeah. So that was a lot easier this year than it was when they were two and just ambulatory. And I remember at one point uh, Leo scrambling up a ladder and Soren scrambling up behind him and then grabbing the back of his shirt and trying to pull him down so he could pass him by. That was the point at which we decided there had to be a full time nanny at the winery. Okay. <laughs> so talk a little, I mean, you've had. Experiences really so both with IPNC and the um, uh, and then the wine industry, you know the the vineyards itself. Talk about your view of the the, the wine community in Oregon and what makes it um, maybe distinct. Well, I think that there is always a sense that your neighbors got your back. If you get into trouble, you can get help. If you need advice about vintage, you can make a phone call. And that's always been critically important to me. When I was at Reed, Reed, like Linfield, has a very strong sense of community. And I really wanted to work somewhere where that sense of community was present. And it most certainly is here. It, it, it produces things like IPNC and the Oregon Pinot Camp and Salute, uh, the wine auction that benefits uh, our vineyard workers in terms of health care. And it also benefits us in very tangible ways. So the very first day of harvest this year, our forklift broke down. I walked around our neighborhood and with, with, within 45 minutes, another winemaker had loaned us a forklift with a rotator on it that we could use with our system for processing fruit. So it's, um, you know, runs the whole gamut of, from producing huge events to getting advice on when to pick during a difficult harvest to just borrowing a piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. And so what, what is it like in terms of, have there been, um, who have been your mentors? Are there is it has it been you know men, women? Or is there a, you know what what is your who's kind of helped you out along the way? Well, the first person I would name would be John Paul from Cameron. Just how John is very passionate about everything that he does, and he's very involved in his winery from the farm that you know from the farm to the bottle to the selling of it. Still, after all of these years. And that's a, mes a message that he sent to us and we've never really lost track of. We never want to be a big enough winery that we can't be doing all of the different aspects ourselves. Um, certainly uh, Terry Castile at Bethel Heights and everybody at Bethel Heights uh, were wonderful, wonderful assets to us mm -hmm. and still are. Uh, David Lett, I worked for for five years and he was the person who said to, when I was making my first vintage of wine with David, stop messing with your wine <laughs> and we never did we never touched it we just talked incessantly about what we could do to make it better but he made me realize that sometimes the best thing to do is to sit on your hands i worked with lynn Penarash for a vintage in 92 and uh you know getting back to women in the wine industry she was a mentor and role model for me in that way mm -hmm. um she has a, a very sort of can-do attitude and nothing is going to take her eye off the prize and uh, it was great to work with her for, for that vintage as well. Mm -hmm. And we actually interviewed Lynn mm -hmm. um, and it was really interesting talking with her about you know really being sort of the first I think the way she describes it the first woman winemaker to be brought in and mm -hmm. hired mm -hmm. um, and sort of what what she ran into in terms of um, you know, speaking of people kind of being surprised that yeah. she was the one doing that. Right. And I, I remember that as well. I, I was still in college when she arrived, 
but the feeling was definitely, hey, who's this hired gun out of California who's come up here and is making waves? And so, you know, if, if there had been available book learning here in Oregon when I was getting into the wine industry, I absolutely would have, mm -hmm. have taken advantage of that. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't, and so you learn from everybody else. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're just about done. Are, is, is there any advice you would have to people who want to get into the wine industry? I think the best advice is that you should work harvest and the things that come on either end of it and really work harvest. <laughs> don't work in a tasting room, don't involve yourself in marketing, really be the person who does everything that gets done in the winery before you start your own winery because you're going to do it eventually <laughs> for yourself. You need to know how to prune a vine, you need to know how your back feels after you sucker vines all day. You need to know how hard it is to pick grapes. You need to know uh, what it feels like to do lots and lots of punch downs until you feel like you can't do them anymore because it's so exhausting. You need to know the joy of picking right at the right time and then watching that, that vat of grapes go through fermentation and turning into a wine that you love. You need to know that 95% of winemaking is cleaning up <laughs> and sanitizing equipment. Um, th there's so much less romance in the traditional sense than people think that if you don't think that there's romance in doing that hard work, and I do, then you should find something else to do. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else? Anyone have? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Of course.